Hello, happy Saturday night. I hope it's a happy Saturday night for you. Not too bad for me. Thus far. <laughs> so Dolores says hi, and Dale says hi, Dolores. Hi, Doc. Kay says hi, Dolores, and everybody. Glad to see you all. Lana says, hola. And Kay says, I needed a good discussion tonight. Laugh out loud. Catherine Tokarska says, hello. hola, everyone. Evelina says, hola. Hola, everybody, since we're doing holas tonight. Hola, everybody. Okay, please share. And while I remember, that's my YouTube channel. You can share, like, and subscribe uh, later. And please remember my Patreon link at patreon.com front slash show underscore Firestone. I will now relieve you of my ticker. And go back to your comments. 
Kay says, been kind of crappy for me today. Laugh out loud. Sorry to hear it, Kay. I guess it's been a crappy day a lot of places in the country. It was a nice day here, though. It was about um, 81 or so, so I think spring's finally come to Washington, D.C. Or the Washington, D.C. area, anyway. Hope you all can hear me. I'm assuming you can hear me. I don't have my earphones in, so I'm not sure whether you can hear me or not, but I suspect you can hear me. All my settings indicate that. So, I'm going to get on to our topic tonight. Not surprisingly, not surprisingly, the HEROES Act. I'm always wondering who the heroes are in that act. Certainly not the people who passed it. But the HEROES Act got passed, I believe, 208 to 199. A lot of people were not voting. There were 14 defections on the Democratic side in the rules vote, actually preceding the final vote. They had to pass a rule first because they could have that vote. It's Ola. Yes, Ola. Right. Sorry. Ola, yes. Yes, the H is uh, silent, except when it's a J. And then you say Jaime, right? And Kay says, oh, God, Steve says the fatalities are now up to 89,404. Kay says the weather was good here, but I need my alone time tonight. Laugh out loud. My roommate is a great guy, but drives me nuts sometimes. Laugh out loud. Well, you're lucky he's a great guy. You are. Yeah, roommates can be a problem as our daughter is telling us, but evidently she has a great roommate now, so she's real happy with that. Anyway, okay, let's get on with it. The bottom line on the HEROES Act, okay, first we'll go to the bottom line on the HEROES Act, and then we'll address the major question for the evening, okay? The bottom line on the HEROES Act is that it's a messaging bill. It tells people, including um, 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 us progressives, what the Democratic leadership um, but, um, but prioritizes. And to us, it says, quote, fuck you, unquote. The act contains some good things, but not the most important, not the most important of the progressive uh, priorities. The final bill includes one trillion in relief aid to states and localities. And boy, do they ever need it. They probably need even more than that. But that was a very, very important thing to do because the states are going to cut back on payroll and we're going to knock out more and more people into the unemployment pool. So this relief aid was very important for states and for localities. That was a very good thing the act uh, um, um, actually did. And to the extent that it didn't seem to be a priority of the Progressive Caucus, it should have been a priority of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, then the second thing was that it extended unemployment um, benefit enhancements. In other words, the $600 per week that Bernie Sanders put in the CARES Act, that he successfully got into the CARES Act, it extends that to the end of January of 2021. And by my calculation, that's probably going to cost $700 paying $80 billion, but 
well worth it. Cost, of course, okay, is no problem. Um, I calculated that for someone getting un unemployment uh, 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 benefits, let's say they start on June 1st and uh, they're getting the extra unemployment benefits, that's another 15600 for uh, the unemployed people over six months. So that's not as good as the Paycheck um, Guarantee Act for many, many, many people. But it certainly would have been nice if people had a choice of either taking that or taking the Paycheck um, um, Guarantee Act, which of course was a priority of Congresswoman Jaya Powell, who has been pushing for it strongly for some time, and it was a very important bill. Anyway, the act uh, also provided okay, another one-time $1,200 stimulus payment to, uh, to every American. I calculated that probably going to come to about $312 billion in spending. So by my calculation, and this is all approximate, these are not actually rigorous calculations, between the relief aid to states and localities and the unemployment benefit enhancements and the stimulus payment to every American, we're looking at uh, more than $2 trillion of the $3 trillion that was in the act that was passed by the House but that the Senate has no intention, okay, of passing. Uh, then there were uh, some other funds, okay, as well in the bill. And even now, I'm not going to mention all of the funds for, uh, for various things. But the bill stops overcharging prisoners for phone, okay, and internet um, in the prisons. That's certainly a good thing to do. It extends food stamp um, funding. That's a comparatively inexpensive thing. I didn't even bother to cost it out. But it's very important for people. Uh, it also protects the post office. I think that was something like um, um, $25 billion in the bill. Fairly small amount considering it was a $3 trillion bill. And it provides funds for testing and tracing. Those are very, very much needed, even that even though that was sort of taken for granted by the progressives. And the bottom line, again, is that this is a messaging bill. So Nancy Pelosi is telling people, telling the progressives, telling the rest of the Democrats, telling the Republicans, that this is what she really, really, really wants to pass. The final bill also included, and here's some important messaging for you, co a COBRA subsidies bailout for the um, insurance companies. People have been complaining uh, that uh, there's nothing um, but four people who are unemployed and are thrown off their uh, health care. So Pelosi wants to give them COBRA subsidies, which is probably the most expensive way to allow them to keep um, 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 health care. And of course, it doesn't do anything for people who uh, were not among uh, the, uh, the unemployed because they dropped out of the workforce or perhaps Well, I'm not sure whether the COBRA would cover people who didn't have insurance in the first place. I didn't read that part of the fine print, okay, of the bill, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did not, so that it doesn't um, actually cover them. Uh, there's a bailout um, in the bill for lobbying organizations. In the original version of the bill, it was both for 501c4s and 501c6s. Now the c4s are uh, uh, 
on, on our packs. Uh, the 501c6s are uh, um, actually lobbying organizations that are large and that claim to be nonprofits of a source. And my understanding of this particular provision in the bill is that there are something like 747 of those organizations in the United States. And this bill would cover something like 727 of them and allow them to apply for bailouts <laughs> under this bill. Now, these are bills that gather money and then act as donors to politicians. So this is a situation where Nancy Pelosi is bailing out her donors. Unfortunately, it's not just her donors. It would be bad if it were just her donors, actually, by itself. But unfortunately, it's not just her donors. It's all the Republican donor organizations, too. You know, the ones that gather all the funds from various places, including the Koch brothers. So there it is. She's just saying, hey, we're going to bail out those who normally bail us out. Hey, isn't that wonderful? And then there are other expensive provisions amounting to hundreds of billions of dollars for rich donors, both corporations okay, and the rich. And uh, these provisions, uh, one of the provisions is yet another tax cut for rich people. And there are other bailout provisions in here um, as well. I'm not going to go through them all. And the final bill is not only saying to progressives, these are priorities of the Democratic Party to do these bailouts for insurance companies, to do these bailouts for the lobbying organizations that are our donors, but also to do these bailouts, okay, for rich people. And then by not including them um, in the bill or the democratic leadership is saying to progressives is saying no to progressives in relation to the following things no recurring basic income cash payments as in the abc act no paycheck guarantee from the federal government as in uh, the Jayapal bill for a paycheck uh, by guarantee. No Medicare paying health care costs of those without uh, health insurance. No federal jobs guarantee. No moratorium on rent and mortgage payments. No, or very little at least, forgiveness of student debt as part of this bill. And for the big companies that are being bailed out by the federal government with a $4.6 trillion slush fund, no public ownership, ownership stake in companies that are bailed out or prohibitions placed on them against further concentration of business through private equity uh, um, buyouts uh, or through mergers and acquisitions uh, um, generally. And finally, no Green New Deal infrastructure provided for in this bill. It totally ignores the Green New Deal, totally ignores it completely. No money for the Green New Deal. Plenty of money for bailing out insurance companies, uh, large uh, lobbying organizations, and expensive provisions in the hundreds of billions for the rich donors. So Pramila Jayapal's conclusion concerning this bill 
um, the Heroes Bill, the so-called um, um, Heroes Bill. The historic, oh, I should say, it does include uh, pay increases for essential frontline workers. But that is little enough uh, taken as a proportion of the bill. Of course, okay, it's ballyhooed because those are the heroes. We got to do something for the heroes. But the amount they're doing for the heroes is not very much. It's a very small proportion of the bill. I don't even know if it amounts to 3% of the bill. So this is all just Washington kabuki. Okay. So Jayapal's conclusion is the historic public health and economic crisis that Americans are facing will not end on its own. We must beat uh, the virus. To beat it, we must keep people home. To keep people home, we must make sure they get their paychecks, that they can access their health care, and they don't feel pressured to return to work before it's safe. And then she concludes, that's the only way that we can give the American people real relief and certainty before this crisis gets worse, because if we fail to do so, it will. Uh, unquote. So that's the bottom line on this bill. Now let's get to what they seem to be planning to do to pay for it. How will they pay for the HEROES Act? Well, we have a little hint from Jim Clyburn, who appeared in an interview with Chuck Todd on MSNBC. Um, Quote, A paycheck guarantee is great. I think doing it this way is an efficient way to do it. In fact, I think it's the most efficient way to do it, says Jim Clyburn. He who virtually single-handedly paved the way for Joe Biden to become the presumptive nominee, not the nominee, but the presumptive nominee. He who greased the way for a presumptive, for a presumptive, okay, I shouldn't say presumptive, I'm not going to say that, okay. He goes on, but we have to pay for all of these things. We just got to the point where the bill just got too big. He thought it just got too big. We have to pay for all of these things. The cost of it just got too high. So we couldn't include the Paycheck Guarantee Act, and we couldn't include the ABC Act, and we couldn't include um, getting people on Medicare for the duration of the COVID crisis because the bill just got too big in cost. So that's why we can't go over three trillion by adding in progressive um, the priorities like having Medicare coverage instead of using COBRA, passing recurring payments like the Jaya Powell Tlaib um, ABC bill, passing a paycheck uh, um, guarantee, uh, um, um, as in the Jaya Powell bill, even though the COBRA cost is greater than the Medicare opening would have been even though the unemployment extension cost 
is greater than the paycheck guarantee would have been. And even though the ABC bill will be paid for by high value platinum coin seniorage, that is by the minting of uh, two trillion dollar coins. So Jim Clyburn is either ignorant or he's lying. But his reply indicates that the House is planning to, quote, pay for it, unquote, like we always do. So let's review how we always pay for it. The United States is a monetary sovereign. Look at Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. It gives Congress the authority to create, to coin, okay, an unlimited amount um, of money. Over the years, that's been interpreted as Congress um, having the right not simply to coin money, but to create as much paper currency as it needs to create and as much in reserves as it needs to create. Congress used uh, uh, the Congress um, has delegated to its agents uh, the task of creating the coins, the tasks of creating the currency, and the tasks of creating the reserves. But still, the government of the United States, through the delegates, the agents of the Congress, create uh, the money of the United States. Also, the United States never borrows in other currencies. It borrows quite a lot, of course, because it's selling debt instruments all the time. But it never borrows in anything except for the dollar, okay, in anything except a currency that it controls. It also allows the value of the dollar to float in the international markets. That happened when we went off the gold standard in 1971, and we ceased um, but, um, but to allow people to turn in their paper dollars for gold at a fixed uh, price. Since then, we've allowed the value of the dollar to float okay, in international markets. And finally, something that's worthwhile um, um, highlighting is that the government of the United States accepts tax payments only in its own currency. It only accepts in the way of tax payments um, high-powered money. The tax settlements take place in the Federal Reserve System alone, not in the private banks, um, um, outside of it. So Congress or its delegated uh, agents, the Treasury and the Fed, can create however much money is needed to pay for congressional appropriations. Now this is something you've heard a lot about from uh, MMT uh, um, economists and MMT writers. Uh, you hear it um, all the time. And this is true in the abstract. But an interesting question is, how do things work when Treasury has to top up its spending account 
to spend the appropriations that Congress makes? And that's a question mark. Why is that a significant thing? Thanks, honey. It's a significant thing because we have a law known as a debt ceiling law. Right now, the debt ceiling is suspended for a while. It's suspended till sometime in 2000, okay, in 21, but it hasn't been repealed. Well, the debt ceiling law is still on the books and it's due to come back in 2000, okay, in 21. So while the government of the United States has been able to top up the spending account in normal ways, most of the time, every once in a while, it becomes paralyzed when it approaches the debt ceiling and it can no longer issue debt instruments for sale. Then there are negotiations that occur. Okay. And then in negotiations, there's always spending that is cut. It's never about tax increases. It's about cuts in federal spending. And it's usually federal spending for the 99% that gets cut in some way and not federal spending that actually benefits the 1%. So these are austerity negotiations that periodically occur due to the presence of the debt um, ceiling law that interferes with the Treasury's ability to top up the spending account. Now, of course, the United States still is a monetary sovereign because Congress can repeal the debt ceiling law anytime it wants or suspend it. Um, um, any time it wants to do so. But if it doesn't want to do so, then the shoelaces of the Treasury Department are tied together and it cannot move forward to spend the appropriations that Congress has already voted. Deficit spending that Congress has already voted cannot be spent even though the Treasury is ordered to spend it because the, a debt ceiling crisis is taking place. We've had a number of those crises over the years, okay, especially since the Republicans took over the House in 2000. Um, 11, when in the early 2000, the early second decade, second um, um, a decade of the 21st uh, century, as in 2011, 2012, and 2013, we heard a lot about debt ceiling crises, and we've had debt ceiling threats since then very, very frequently. So we have to attend to how the Treasury Department tops up its spending account in order to spend what Congress uh, um, um, has voted. And notice the $4 trillion that Congress has already appropriated is there to be spent. Will it all be spent by the time that uh, the debt ceiling is restored again by the time the suspension comes off of the debt ceiling? If not, if not, then those appropriations are going to be up for further negotiations. And if some of those appropriations are about supplying relief 
for people who need it, you can count on the forces of austerity, the centrist Democrats, the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House, okay, and in the Senate. And you can count on the whole Republican Party to suddenly become very, very interested in the debt, the size of the debt. And if you think they were interested before, right now, we're on track um, to run deficits that will be in the trillions of dollars, totally unprecedented. They won't be $1 trillion deficits. Before we're through this year, we might have a $6 trillion deficit, a $7 trillion deficit. How are they going to top up the Treasury spending account when we have such a deficit? Well, one way is that the Fed adds reserves to the Treasury spending account after debt instruments are bought and sold by destroying the proceeds from the sale of debt instruments and by marking up the Treasury general account, that's the Treasury spending account, that's the formal name of it, the Treasury general account, on a dollar for dollar basis. That is the amount of the debt instruments that are sold is both destroyed by the Fed and the Treasury Department's spending account is marked up on, on a dollar for basis. For every dollar borrowed, there's a new dollar created in the Treasury spending account. Second, the Fed also destroys Treasury deposits of tax revenues in the process of settlement and marks up the Treasury general account dollar for dollar for every dollar deposited and destroyed by the Fed. The Treasury spending account is marked up by that particular dollar, one for one. Now, a third way the Treasury's uh, general account is marked up. The Fed adds to the U.S. Mint's um, public enterprise fund account the coin seniorage um, earned by the mint when it ships coins to the Fed to be distributed into the banking system. And the coin seniorage, which is earned by the mint and which resides in the public enterprise fund account okay, of the mint, is then periodically swept by the treasury into the treasury general account. And when the treasury department does that sweep, the Federal Reserve adds the seniorage amount to the treasury general account. Now the coin seniorage, uh, that particular method adds very little to the treasury spending account in a normal okay, and typical year. All the dimes and quarters and the silver dollars, 50 cent pieces, all the seniorage that's earned okay, from that, and that is periodically swept into the TGA amounts to roughly 500 million a year. Just the pittance compared to the trillions spent by the treasury. But the important thing to emphasize is that uh, the method of topping up the treasury account through coin seniorage is a normal method. It goes on all the time. It's been going on for years. There is nothing new about it. However, 
the coin seniorage method can be extended by the U.S. Mint through its creating high-value platinum coins. This authority was given to the Treasury Department um, and to the Mint through the 1995 um, coin law that was passed by a Republican Congress. So using um, high-value platinum coins of, let's say, $100 billion, $1 trillion, $5 trillion, um, $100 trillion, that is not normal. That has never happened before. It's been debated very energetically in the summer of 2011 and again in the fall of 2012 and the winter of 2013. But that method has never been extended through using high-value platinum coin um, a seniorage. So I want to emphasize the method is normal when it comes to relying on the face value of coins and computing the profit by comparing the face value of the coins to the value of the metal in the coins. But it's not normal, okay, in other ways. I may have said that, okay, exactly backwards. It's normal, okay, in other ways. But it's not normal to have an extremely high value of that. That has not happened yet. The first bill to propose to use this method of adding reserves to the Treasury spending account is the Automatic Boost to Communities Act, the ABC Act, which was introduced by uh, Premier Jayapal and Rashida Tlaib. And is introduced in the House uh, right now, but which was ignored by Nancy Pelosi in the HEROES Act. Though certainly, if it had been included, this would have been a different kind of HEROES Act because it was pretty heroic uh, for Rashida okay, and um, um, also Pramila to have introduced the ABC Act and to have taken on the, the slings and arrows of outrageous commentary in doing so. Um, here's another method that could be used to top up the Treasury spending account, which is certainly not normal. And that method is what I've called overt congressional financing. I mentioned that in my live stream on Thursday, and occasionally okay, I mention it. I'm going to mention it okay, again. It's the um, OCF method over congressional financing. In this method, the Congress orders the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account with the estimated amount of reserves Congress um, has appropriated. Okay, and in addition, the Congress orders the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account with the estimated amount of reserves needed to redeem all Treasury debt instruments and all interest payments falling due during the period of an appropriation. If the language to do overt congressional financing was to become basically boilerplate, inside of every money bill passed by the Congress. Then the Fed would automatically by be topping up the Treasury spending account 
for most everything the treasury had to spend um, during a particular spending period. And then treasury would not have to use its, uh, would not have to be credited with the tax revenue um, um, by the Fed. And also, uh, it would not have to sell any more debt instruments in order to get the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account to cover deficit uh, spending. But with overt congressional financing, in each appropriation period, the former Treasury debt, that is to say the Treasury debt that's existing now, would be getting smaller and smaller because it would be paid off in each appropriation period. Not faster than the debt falls due, but as it falls due. So it would take 30 years to pay down the treasury debt uh, to zero. But since a lot of the treasury debt is short-term debt, in a very, very short time, the public would notice that our debt was getting smaller and smaller, and they would accept as a political matter the important political conclusion that uh, the debt of the federal government is not important for solvency. It's not important for allowing the federal government, the Treasury Department, to spend its congressional appropriations. And that is such an important thing to get done, not from an economic solvency point of view, a financial solvency point of view, but from a political economics point of view, or from a political point of view. I care a lot about that because I'm a political scientist at heart, not um, an economist um, at heart. So okay, what I wanna do now is um, point out, first of all, that there's no intention to use overt congressional financing when it comes to the leaders of the Democratic Party in Congress right now. They might not even have heard of overt congressional financing. They have no intention either of minting platinum coins to cover spending. What they want to do is to cover spending in the old way. And what is the old way? The old way, of course, the old way, of course, is to rely on the Fed topping up the account after taxes are paid or the Fed topping up the account um, after treasury securities are sold. That's the old way. So if over the next two years, we suddenly increase our debt subject to the limit, our national debt, from its current, what is it now, roughly 23 and a half trillion to 33 and a half trillion. What's going to happen? What's going to happen when two years from now we wake up in the morning and there's a debt of 33 and a half um, a trillion dollars? And the deficit um, terrorists, the austerity mongers, start ranting and raving at the public 
with all their propaganda capacity that, oh, look how much we owe. It's going to be a terrible burden on our grandchildren. It's now a terrible burden on our children and ourselves. The only thing we can do about it is cut uh, all federal benefits to people is to cut it all and to run surpluses for many, many years. And everybody's just going to have to bite uh, the bullet to save our children and our grandchildren. Okay, everybody's just going to have to impoverish ourselves because this is supposed to be good for our children and our grandchildren. Impoverish ourselves so we have nothing to leave to our children and our grandchildren. Destroy all our private wealth by running federal surpluses. That's what they'll be saying. How do I know? Because that's what they've always said in the past. Jim Clyburn is hinting at that now. He's saying we had to stop this at three trillion. We couldn't have passed the Jay Powell bill. We couldn't have passed the bill to let people onto Medicare because if we had, that might have increased the spending by another trillion or trillion and a half. And we couldn't afford that. We could afford the three, three trillion with its bailouts for the wealthy. And we could uh, afford the previous four trillion that's already appropriated, where more than half of it is for the rich. I mean, we could afford all that. But we can't afford it now when people come forward with actual significant relief for most of the people who are suffering. That's what Clyburn is hinting at us. And it's not just Clyburn's view. It is the view of the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House. And in the Senate, they are all Austerians. In the last few years, since 2015, when the Peterson Summit Conference comes around each year, one person you're very likely to find there is Nancy Pelosi. And she's talking about how to budget and about public finance in much the same way that Kevin McCarthy is for the Republicans. They're sharing assumptions. They're sharing what to do about it. One party is slightly more gentle than the other. That's all. The basic framework, the basic framework on, 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 is the same. So what they're doing now is they're setting up the situation to bail themselves out, to bail their donors out, and to bail the wealthy out. And then to say to us, we can't afford to spend anymore. The Republicans are already saying that. And Jim Clyburn just said that again in this bill, um, in this interview that he had with Chuck Todd. On behalf of Nancy Pelosi, on behalf of Steny Hoyer, on behalf of Hakeem Jeffries, they're saying, they're saying, we can't afford it. Right after they have passed a number of measures without even considering how we're going to pay for it. Why? 
because they're going to pay for it by selling debt instruments since the debt ceiling is suspended. They're going to pay for it by selling the debt instruments. And then after the debt has increased by another $10 trillion, they're going to come back at us and say, look how terrible the debt is. We need to take away your Social Security. We need to take away your Medicare because that's where the money is. That's what they're going to say to us. But before they do, I want you to understand how simple it is to pay for things if the Congress really wants to pay for them. Now, certainly minting the coin is good. I'm all for minting the coin. I literally wrote the book on the coin, the only book yet on the coin. You can find it, okay, at Amazon. But uh, the coin is something for the executive branch to do when the executive branch is caught um, in a bind. Uh, between a debt crisis and appropriations that it has to spend. That's something for ending debt ceiling crises. But the cleanest and the easiest way to pay for things without even bothering to worry about taxes for revenue, which is not really true anyway, or selling bonds uh, for the proceeds, okay, of the auctions, the easiest way to handle it is through overt um, congressional financing. That's the easiest way out of austerity. What we have to do is get it introduced um, into Congress and within a two-year period in Congress, this language will become institutionalized as a routine something that a fiscally responsible Congress will want to do because it won't want to have any more debt ceiling crises or any more political crises, because everybody's upset about the size of the debt. So here it is. I'm going to start to share my screen now. So you can see the language. Okay. So the language is, upon passage of this appropriations bill, the Federal Reserve is directed to fill the Treasury spending account at the New York uh, uh, Federal Reserve, because that's where the Treasury general account is. It's there. With the addition to its reserve balance necessary to spend uh, this appropriation. Now, sometimes, okay, it's not um, um, an appropriation bill. It might be, uh, it's not technically called an appropriation bill. It might be called a uh, um, 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 continuing resolution bill, but it's still a bill that appropriates money. So there is an appropriation in the bill. Um, um, um. In addition, the Federal Reserve is directed to fill the Treasury spending account 
with the additions to the Treasury Reserve balances necessary to repay all outstanding debt instruments, including principal and interest, as they fall due for the fiscal year of this appropriation. That's it, folks. That's the two sentences of boilerplate that need to be put into every money bill. Clean, just an order from the Congress to the Federal Reserve to top up the Treasury accounts to cover these two things. And once Congress begins doing that every year as standard operating procedure, nobody would dare to discontinue it because everybody would immediately point out, if you do that, you're going to start creating public debt again. You're going to start creating the national debt again. And we don't want to do that because everybody hates the national debt. They would have to get over that political hurdle to discontinue this. I think that would be very hard. So that's the language. So when politicians are asked, um, how are you going to pay for it? They're not being asked uh, the question, how are you going to get it appropriated? They're not asking that question. Uh, lots of times in the last two years, you've heard, okay, from MMT um, economists, things are paid for by Congress appropriating them. But that's kind of an opaque answer. It's true in a way. It's true in a way because once something is appropriated, by hook or by crook, it has to be spent. But that isn't what people are asking. When people ask, how are you going to pay for it? Those people are thinking of the debt ceiling situation and of the freezes in spending which occur at the federal level due to the debt ceiling crises. So what they're asking of the candidate who wants to deficit spend and who may want to deficit spend uh, but quite a bit, they're asking, how are you going to fill up the treasury spending account if you're not going to tax for it and you're not going to borrow for it? That's what they're really asking. So how you're going to pay for it is about how you're going to top up the treasury spending account without taxing or borrowing. So here's a briefer version of the language, okay, of the Q&A. Question. Your programs look expensive. How are you going to pay for them? Answer. At the end of every money bill, we'll order the Fed to increase the balance in the Treasury's spending account by the amount we've ordered it to spend. We'll also order it to increase the same balance by enough to cancel the portion of the, quote, national debt, unquote, falling due during the period covered by our spending, um, um, unquote. That will be the question and the answer. Brief, right? So that will fund new spending and also reduce parts of the debt as we go along until the national debt is um, eventually gone over 30 years. He's a, here's a still briefer Q&A for creating overt congressional financing. Question, quote, your programs look expensive. How are you going to pay for them? Unquote. Answer, easy. When we pass a spending bill, We'll just order the Fed to immediately add new dollars to the Treasury's account to pay for new spending and repaying the debt as we go along until it is eventually gone. How's that for brief? 
That's all Bernie should have said during the preceding campaign when he was asked how you're going to pay for it. He should have said easy. When we pass a spending bill and provided you give me a Congress that I can work with, we'll just order the Fed to immediately add new dollars to the Treasury's account to pay for new spending and repaying debt as we go along until it is eventually gone. That's all Bernie had to say. Why couldn't I get through to Bernie? I don't know. I tried in various ways to get uh, through to Bernie. But I couldn't get through. I mean, Bernie has screens. Screens. You can't get to politicians if you want to give them some intelligence very easy, easily. You just don't have access. Um, um, I came out with the overt congressional financing um, idea in the fall of 2017. I haven't been able to get it out to Bernie since that time. I haven't been able to get it out to anybody else either. I mean, I've been able to get it out to people who watch my show, sure. And then finally, final language, as brief as possible. Question. Your programs look expensive. How are you going to pay for them? Um, answer. We're Congress. We'll just order the Fed to give Treasury the money. Unquote. And that is all she wrote, folks. I mean, um, but that's it. Now, one more thing. One more thing to take note of. One reason why the progressives were not able to get better results for their priorities um, 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 in the run-up to uh, the Heroes Bill, in the run-up to the Heroes Bill, was because the progressives in Congress did not organize very well. Now, I'm sure part of that was due to the fact that they weren't in Washington, very many of them, because of the lockdown. I don't know why they weren't meeting as a whole body using Zoom, however. They were not at all getting organized. I have linked you in a description to an article in The Intercept, which describes how poorly organized uh, they were. They couldn't agree on a platform okay, of uh, actual priorities for the progressive You give it to Nancy Pelosi, and you give it to leadership, and what happens is they pick things off one by one, and they exclude all of the real priorities, okay? like anybody's wish list would include help for the post office, and more money for contact tracing okay, and testing. Sure. Those things would be, K okay, in anything. An enhancement, K okay, of the unemployment insurance, because the current round is uh, supposed to expire. And maybe because people need it right now, 
Okay, another stimulus check uh, really quickly. Those are things that anybody would ask for. But the priorities that were really important to the progressives, not one of them got into that bill because the progressives were not organized by Jayapal and by Pocan in the CPC. They're the co-chairs of the CPC. They didn't get the support of the CPC. They couldn't pull together all the interest groups in back of them, all the movement groups that were in back of them, all of them that wanted to see something done. They were unable to move in a politically competent way because they were dispersed all over the place and they were in a very, very large group and they were facing a leadership team. Of people who were working in the Congress, working for the leadership team. And also Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn and Steny Hoyer. And Nancy Pelosi wasn't back in California. She stayed so she could control things. She basically disempowered all of the other, most of the other representatives in Congress, not only the progressives, centrists too, were disempowered. Well, I should say they're the rightists in the Democratic Party, people to the right of Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn. There are such people. But they were pretty well disempowered also. Then they come into Congress, they come back into session because Nancy Pelosi wants to pass something. She gives them a bill on Tuesday, rams it down their throat on Friday. It's an 1815 page bill, and the progressives are not in a position. Um, at the time to get together and to say, we're not voting for this bill. We had no part in doing this bill and we're not voting for it. And all 90 of us are going to oppose it to a person. And it's not going to pass. It's not going to pass the house. This is not something we progressives are going to run on. It's not something we're going to run on. We're voting no on this bill. Here's our agenda. We wrote it up. Now, I know the progressives couldn't get the legislative resources inside of Congress to write up their bill because the leadership bills have priority. And Pelosi monopolized that with an 1,815-page bill. The ABC Act is a short bill. I forget how long it is. What is it, 85 pages or something? It's a short bill. The Paycheck uh, Guarantee Act is a short bill. Nancy's 1,800-page bill was written by, she probably compiled it from lobbyists who are in Washington all the time, and then gave the details two legislative staff still working inside of Congress to write up because she had command. She's the leader. She has command of that staff. She has priority over their resources. So the progressives had to know that was coming because that's the way she operated with the previous relief bills. So it was on them to organize use external resources they had from the movement groups. And they needed to have these bills written by movement legal staffs so that they could have handed Nancy Pelosi their bills. 
and said, this is what we want passed. If you want our votes, you have to get this in. And by the way, we're not bailing out any lobbyists who bring people to vote against us and our programs. In no way are we going to bail them out. That's corrupt. We're not having any of that corruption. And we're not bailing out the insurance companies with COBRA. And we're not bailing out the rich anymore. You bailed them out enough in the first four bills. You're not bailing them out in this one. That stuff has got to go. Before it passes the House, it's got to go. It is not going into something that is going to be presented to Mitch McConnell. Because what Mitch McConnell is going to do then is he's going to get this bill um, up in the Senate and he's going to cut out every good thing that is in that bill. And he'll leave all the bad things that you put into this bill and he'll call that a compromise and say, we need a bipartisan bill and call on you to pass a bipartisan bill with all the crap in it. And we're not having that again anymore, Nancy Pelosi. That's what these progressives needed to do. And the truth is, they were not up to the task. Okay, I had to say that. And I also gave you a link to another article from uh, Common Dreams. It contains the Clyburn quote, and the title of the article was, Why Democrats Lose Elections. Clyburn admits the paycheck guarantee is the best way to save jobs, but he says it costs too much. That's the way Democrats uh, lose elections. Jake Johnson, who wrote that, was entirely correct. So here we go. I'm going to consider your comments now. We have plenty of time tonight to do that. I see you have a raft of comments. Before I consider those, though, I'm going to in hope you'll indulge me. I want to run my ticker one more time. There we go. So remember my Patreon link at patreon.com front slash Joe underscore Firestone. Then please share, like, and subscribe um, at my YouTube channel. And all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Joseph uh, Firestone and you will find it. Okay, back to your comments. Let's go take them from the top. And let's get through the Olas. Okay, and even when it says yes, the J makes um, an H sound. Yes, I did learn that somewhere along the way. The J makes an H sound. Okay, says yes, I am lucky. Carmen says hi, everyone. Hope this device behaves. If not, I'll have to switch to Averroes which is the French name for April. Steve Wolfbrand says, good evening all. And Dale Weaver says, hi, Steve. And Kay says, hi. Carmen says, yes, that is a good thing. Less profit for exploitative corporations. And Carmen says, what? Is it money for money? Carmen says, tax cuts during the Depression. That kind of seals the coffin. Well, not really. I mean, as, as long as it's not uh, tax cuts for the rich, if it's tax cuts for the poor, it could be stimulative. 
Okay, remember, if we deficit spend K in the right way, we can afford to deficit spend um, um, as much as we need to um, in a down economy, because if the economy is depressed, it takes an awful lot of deficit spending to cause inflation. Carmen says, with friends like Nancy who needs enemies, she is our enemy. We have to understand this leadership of a Democratic Party in Congress is the enemy of the people. We cannot allow them to come back into their positions. They may or may not get into Congress again. Steny Hoyer is facing a challenge from a lady by the name of Michaela Wilkes. She may be a good campaigner. It's hard to tell, of course. It's a rough go for her because she can't do canvassing. She can't do the in-person stuff. It all has to be by social media. Okay, Steny has the name. I mean, he's been in the Congress now for 20 terms. 20 terms. It's incredible. Carol Steinhausen Bergerdorf says, thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you for coming, Carol. Evelina gives me the fist. <laughs> Carmen says, we need Bernie back to reignite our progressive focus okay, and policies. Steve says, the word hero has become heavily overused. I noticed. Russ says, Clyburn is straight up neoliberal. Carmen says, yep, neoliberals stick together. Everything else is theater. Steve says, I wish people would quit thinking that Bernie's coming back. He's gone to the dark side. I don't think uh, uh, anybody was thinking he was coming back. They were just wishing he was coming back. And Lana asks, has everyone shared to their page? I hope so. Thank you, Lana. And Carmen says, I need another pot of tea to calm my nerves, says Carmen. Steve says, I shared. Thank you, Steve. And Matt says, too big, too high. And these terms are so silly. Yes, they're highly qualitative in nature and can mean anything to anybody. And Lana says, oh, God, Clyburn carping about the costs. Um, JFC. What's JFC? I missed that. What's JFC? Carmen says, I'm staying in focus. I've never been into wallowing in defeatism. Lana says, these half-baked Democrats are on my last nerve. And Russ says, God, I hate this Clyburn guy. <laughs> Me too. I, I have for some time. He's awful. He's awful. I mean, he's so bad for black people. It's just awful. I shouldn't say that, though, because I'm not a black person living in South Carolina. So they have the full experience of Jim Clyburn. I don't. Carmen Wiener says, and I wish you'd stop trying this ways just because your butt hurts still. It's about the big picture, not the person. Bernie is just a cool conduit. Evelina says, Clyburn's a clown. Kay says, Clyburn is bought and paid for like too many others. We used to have a word for that back in the 60s. Matter of fact, we've had that word since the, or that phrase since the 1860s. But we had it back in the 1960s too. And Rick says, evening all. And Matt says, he is in the pocket of big pharma. Lana says, I would add Clyburn is an establishment puppet. Yes, he is. He's Obama's puppet. And Matt, uh, and Lana says to Matt, that too. And Carmen says, precisely why I'm going to put on tea. Wish I could offer you a cup or two or three. Jasmine with lime comes my gut. Well, thank you, Carmen. I've got some turmeric. I've got uh, some turmeric uh, with ginger. That's my tea over here. Mm. 
And Lana says, Carmen, I love tea. Drink different types all day. Carmen says, it helps me a lot. Just the warmth alone is healing. Yes, it is. Sandy says, hello, hello, Sandy. Steve says, hi, Sandy. Kay says, the water here in Ohio is so bad. The closest I get to water is coffee and beer. <laughs> Laugh out loud, fracking waste dump here. I miss my well water badly. Sandy says, hi, Steve. Sandy says, hi, Kay. Hi, Sandy. Carmen says, oh, my God, I can't imagine. Kay says, chlorine is so bad here, I have to run water into an empty jug and let the lid off so some of it uh, dissipates, or I can't even make coffee or water the plants. Carmen says, I do that, too. I let my water sit overnight before using it. Kay says, I let mine sit for a few days. Kay says, uh, the Graham, the GOP idiot, is already trying to get rid of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. Well, he always does that. I mean, he's doing that all the time. Constantly. Carmen says, Congress knows um, um, MMT or so an MMT economist says because he taught them. Was it Bill Black, I believe? So what's the confusion still? If anybody taught some people in Congress, um, MMT, I think it was Stephanie Kelton. I don't think it was Bill. It may be Bill has taught some of them from some MMT. But I think uh, when Stephanie was uh, serving on the budget committee um, in the Senate, she got to some people in both the Senate and the House. Um, Evelina says no political bill. Uh, will and Harriet uh, McGonner, uh, hi Harriet, says current and past um, economic priorities have steadily allocated monies provided to the U.S. government by workers, consumers, taxpayers, and voters, largely to military discretionary spending. There is no limitation of money for perpetual wars, corporate profits, and suppression of the people who finance this wasteful atrocity. The central banking system is useless and serves the establishment instead of serving and protecting the people. This system is not broken because it was built in that way. That's true, but of course, if we can gain control of it, then we can use it for ourselves. And that's what we need to do. Carmen says, he taught them correction. Evelina says, austerity is their answer. Carmen says, that's that harmless, harmful, needless austerity narrative that keeps us enslaved to neoliberalism and slave wage corporations. Are there any other countries that are more advanced in their mechanisms of public financing? No. But the idea of um, overt monetary financing has come to England. Uh, through the former head of the Bank of England. <laughs> Who's the one who called it overt monetary financing, okay, or OMF. And who, after he resigned, he advocated for it. But his advocacy has borne no fruit um, so far. But he provided the, the rationale for it. Okay, in England, uh, the UK is a monetary sovereign nation right now, and it can practice overt uh, the parliamentary financing. That is to say, uh, the parliament can order uh, the Bank of England uh, to top up uh, the account of the exchequer <laughs> at uh, the Bank of England. That can happen all the time. Uh, they don't have to issue any more debt um, um, either. Neither does the Australian government. Neither does the Canadian government. Neither does the New Zealand government. 
Neither does the Japanese government. Neither does the Swiss government. Neither does the Danish government. There are many governments in the world that are monetarily sovereign. Evelina says, not uh, the UK, they use austerity measures. That's by choice. They don't have to use austerity measures any more than the United States does. Lana says, Pago Pelosi is a Republican in a Democratic Jersey. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Lana says, Republicans, um, but say the Democrats are taking dollars from working people and giving it uh, 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 to illegal immigrants. And I think that's the face plant. Kay says, um, I got unfriended by another blue no matter who today because I told her that Biden needs to work for my vote and not the other way around, they'll laugh out loud. Yeah, I, I don't know where they get that from. He's the candidate. I'm the voter. Get my vote. You can get my vote. You can get my vote. Just come out for Medicare for All, for a Green New Deal, for the federal job guarantee, and for a basic income, and for student debt elimination, and for free college. Yeah. I got a lot of things I want to see done. But it's the easiest thing for you in the world to advocate them for them. All you got to do is bring Bernie in as your vice presidential nominee and then run on Bernie's platform and you got it made in the shade. Uh, but Evelina says perhaps what's worse is that they don't even know it. Kay says, oh, what do you guys think of the so-called task forces, okay, in Biden's agenda? <sighs> I'm having a real tough time understanding the function of the task forces unless the function of the task forces are to co-opt the Bernie people who get put on the task forces. But I don't see the Bernie people uh, co-opting the Biden people on the task forces. I think the task forces are just for show. A show, okay, of, you know, of unity. They're just for show. We should start to demand that the proceedings of those task forces be public and transparent. We want to see what those Biden people say. Carmen says, I sent those OCF postcards to senators a few years ago. Yeah, they probably just ignored them. Lana says, I need those postcards. Carmen says, you're psychic. Evelina says he thinks he can tempt uh, the progressives into voting for him. Has he got another thing coming for him? I think he does have another thing coming for him. Russ says, I used your OCF clause in my recent uh, letters to the Congress, Curtis. Thanks, Russ. And Kay says, um, um, Evelina, that's what I thought too. Carmen says, I think the template was on RP, but I'm not certain. No, it wasn't on RP. The template was in the certified letters group. That's where I put uh, the template. It's still there today. You can find it uh, today, that letter. I think it's still pinned. 
in the certified uh, letters group. Maybe we should try it again. The Pelosi should have called it the Ice Cream Act instead of the Heroes Act. Yes, that would have been much more descriptive. Um, ice cream for the lobbyists. Um, ice cream for the insurance companies. Evelina says, yeah, yeah, I agree. And Susan says, but they never ask this for military industrial complex spending. No, because they know they're going to borrow money for it. And they know they're going to run up the debt for it, or at least it's going to have a part in running up the debt. And then they'll use the debt to argue that they have to cut our spending. Even Lena says, haha, I agree. Amazing, isn't it? Daniel Going says, I think staying home, it's ever been a good idea, is a complete moron, just like wearing a mask is totally foolish, not to mention you're depleting oxygen. Okay, wearing a mask is not about you. It's about them. Wearing a mask has now been shown empirically, empirically in Taiwan and other nations to slow down the spread of the virus. Your viruses do not so easily get on to other people. Daniel. Daniel. Other people here have been reading the news from all over the world. And the news is that masks are effective and they slow down the spread. Smart people here are wearing masks, not to protect themselves so much as to protect others. But if everybody wears masks, then everybody is protected. I don't appreciate people who don't wear masks in my presence if they're not in my household, Daniel. Susan says, they never ask this for trillion dollar tax cuts. No, because they expect to borrow the money. I mean, the big banks want the bonds. The big buyers want to have access to the bonds. They put their idle money there. Susan says they never asked this for big bank bailouts. I know. So we have to start asking it for the big bank bailouts, right? I mean, it's such a weak argument to say, well, why are you asking me that question? You never ask it for the big bank bailouts. We have to go beyond that. We have to ask it for the big bank bailouts and for the military back out. We have to ask, how are you going to pay for it? Russ says, Dr. Joe, I don't think I have those additional OCF uh, meme responses. Do you have a link on them? Actually, I don't have a link on them. So maybe I should put them on to Facebook. I just did, didn't I? I guess I didn't put them into link. I, this, I guess this got into Facebook, but they didn't get up there as individual links. So what I will do is I will do a Facebook and put those memes into Facebook. And then there'll be a link to them on my Facebook page. How's that, Russ? Susan says, I still think voters need to understand what the national debt is and why. Okay, it's not a problem. They do need to understand. They do need to understand, Susan. You're quite right. But it's taking a long time to break through and get them to understand. And if this language 
were placed into every money bill, if we could get it into money bills um, in the first place, then voters would see in the first six months why the national debt is not a problem. They would see it because the national debt would be far lower within six months. I figure six trillion of it would be paid off in six months. And they would ask, well, how is it paid off? It was paid off because the Congress used its power to get the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account so Treasury didn't have to issue any more debt. And six months of it was paid off and now it's way down. So you see, the federal government always had the capacity to pay it off. It was always easy to pay off. Congress was just making a choice not to pay it off. A stupid choice. Carmen said, hell, he had Professor Kelton right there under him. Yeah, Bernie did, yeah. And Steve said, Weaver and Rocha kept uh, Bernie out of touch. Well, now they're gone, hopefully. Matt says, Joe is a political scientist. Think through for me what the likely consequences would have been if Sanders had tried to push um, um, OCF or Mint to the coin. Well, it depends on when Sanders had tried uh, to push them. It seems to me that if Bernie had become the president and he had used uh, the coin because he got into a debt ceiling crisis type of situation, given his position as president, he would have been easily able to explain the coin to people um, 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 in a way they could um, understand it. Um, um, I have a blog post that's still at uh, my new economic uh, perspectives. If I recall correctly, I'm certain the same blog post, okay, is in daily costs. And it has a speech which the president could make to people to inform them that he was using the platinum coin. I think it's a speech that would have been pretty effective if it was used by a president. However, in the situation Bernie was in, okay, of running for office, if he had been asked, how are you going to pay for it? The proper response was the OCF. Uh, response, because it couples both the appropriation of Congress with the orders of Congress to the Federal Reserve to fill up the Treasury spending account. So that's a very simple and complete answer. In other words, what could the reporter say, okay, in reply, or the other people say? What they would say is they would say, well, um, how can you do that, Bernie? Uh, what happens if you have a hostile Congress? So Bernie can say, look, if I had a hostile Congress, I wouldn't be getting through Medicare for all at all. I'll only be getting Medicare for all through if I have the Congress that will pass Medicare for all. And so if I choose to pay for Medicare for all using overt congressional financing, all I've got to do is persuade that Congress to put these two sentences into the Medicare for all bill. Or put these two sentences into the appropriations bill that contained Medicare for all. Uh, that would have been very easy to do. Now, one other thing the opponents could easily say is, if you create all this money for appropriations, you're sure to have inflation. And the reply to that is, no, 
I'm not going to have inflation. And the reason why I'm not going to have inflation is because we're still going to tax as we've been taxing. And taxes, our taxes will destroy the money. The Treasury Department will no longer be credited, will no longer have its spending account um, 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 accredited in the settlement of the tax deposits. The reason why being that uh, the money was already advanced by the Fed to the Treasury spending account. So, as long as we keep on taxing, okay, an appropriate amount, and as long as we use certain other measures, which will be part of my program, uh, we're not going to have any inflation. Overt congressional financing is no more inflationary than the method of deficit financing we're using now. No more, okay, and no less. Because the only difference is with overt congressional financing, we add money to the economy in some specific amount. And with the way we do deficit financing now, we add net financial assets to the economy uh, in the form of the treasury debt instruments. But those debt instruments are very liquid. People can sell them anytime they want and turn them into reserves and use the reserves in private spending anyway. So this is no more inflationary. And there's no other issue involved. Congress has the power under Article 1, Section 8 to order the Federal Reserve to fill up the Treasury spending account. That's all the authority it needs. And Lana says, I gave it to James Galbraith. That's the OCF language, but not sure if it went anywhere else. Yeah, Jamie never wrote me about that, so I don't think it went anywhere else. If he was really taken with it, he would have sent me a note. Carmen said, yeah, I didn't get any replies either, and I left my phone number, P.O. box, and email on the cards. I was in a better economic position back then. Steve said, when how are you going to pay for it becomes where will you get uh, the votes? Uh, we'll be getting somewhere. Right. We'll be getting somewhere then because how you're going to pay for it is a question that's asked to stop us from getting the votes. Evelina says, why didn't Nancy Pelosi allow um, the virtual voting? Because she wanted control over the legislation. That's why. She wanted control over the bailout so she could save her austerity principles. She is the fox in the hen house. Get her out of the hen house. Evelina says, uh, my guess is that she knows it would be better for the progressives. Yeah, much better. Evelina says, but of course, Steve says 35 watching, not bad. Yep. And 25 still here, 27 still here, not too bad. Susan says, Congress likes it. The voters don't understand what the national debt is because... It allows Congress to use it as an excuse to not pass progressive policy. That is why they won't do OCF or mint of the coin. That is true, Susan. But on the other hand, if we'd had a progressive um, by victory this year with Bernie becoming the president and a number of other progressives getting into Congress okay, in a wave by the progressives, then we'd be in a much better position to pass Medicare for All, to pass the Green New Deal, and to use um, OCF. And of course, we would be in a much better position to use Mint the Coin because the president can order the Treasury Department to order the Mint to Mint of the Coin if necessary. And necessary is when you come upon a debt ceiling crisis where the Republicans want to hold you up. And Carmen says, they shun us progressives. 
yeah, they shun us progressives because we go along with them in the end. They would not be shunning the progressives if we could beat them up a few times. So our progressives need to figure out how to beat them up a few times. Otherwise, there's no point in voting for Democratic Party progressives. No point at all. We should only vote for progressives who are outside of the Democratic Party and who will replace Democrats and who will deny Democrats their votes unless they propose bills that are progressive. Susan says, Matt, they would just ignore him like they do now. Dan Peterson says, Susan Eldridge, financial economics are a mystery. Most Americans and nation are completely illiterate of these disciplines. Big part of the reason how we landed here. Yeah, money creation, purpose of the Federal Reserve. Okay, money is a commodity, credit card debt. These are a complete mystery to Americans. Yes, they are. Nancy's 1,800-page bill written by whom? Most probably by lobbyists and by some of the legislative staff she controls. Susan says Congress knows exactly how it works and they like it that way. I don't think Congress in the mass knows exactly how it works. I think there are a number of Congress people who do know exactly how it works. But I think there are a lot of Congress people who don't know exactly how this works. There are a lot of dumb and ignorant Congress people because they have never had to wise up and they don't care to. Because what wising up is about for them is getting money from their donors. It isn't learning how the money system works. It's learning how the money tree works, their money tree, and how you shake it. And Steve says, Bernie and AOC are on Biden's task forces because Biden doesn't have a platform. Wouldn't understand it if he did. If, if it did. Oh, quite a joke. Yeah, they're not the only two on the task forces either. Sarah Nelson is on the task force as well. Evelina Pont says, to be fair, that goes for ordinary people everywhere. They can be a bit keen on history and... Um, yeah, what's that? A bit keen on history and political Vien, though. I'm not sure what that means. Evelina says keener. Okay. And Carmen says Nancy's bill was written by ice cream and refrigerator moguls. Susan says, the only way we will see change is to educate the public and tell them to bird dog their candidates so they vote for the bills we need or we vote them out. Evelina says, political science. And Ryan uh, Odagawa says, and the rich say they don't want handouts, yet they get the biggest handouts. Absolutely. They don't want handouts until their businesses are in trouble. And they then they want these huge, huge handouts. And they don't want anybody to ask the question, how are you going to pay for it? Steve says, it looks like um, AMLO is going the austerity route. Um, um, thoughts, that, Doc? I'm not sure AMLO has any choice. I don't know. Uh, whether Mexico uh, has been on the receiving end of any money borrowed in foreign uh, uh, the currency. It certainly was during the 1980s. Specifically, it was on the receiving end, okay, of dollars. And I don't know if it still is, but it may be that Mexico is not a monetary sovereign right now, Steve. If you're not a monetary sovereign you potentially got uh, troubles with the neoliberal institutions, the World Bank and the IMF. Daniel Goheen says no mandatory vaccines. 
Karma Muna says that might phase that might. Hell Stephen Day says um, OCF um, as needed. I think OCF all the time. And then just destroying any tax money, okay, or bond money. Carmen says, I'd like to use a clockwork orange method so they realize how many people they've killed with artificial scarcity and needless um, austerity. Well, I've scrolled down. I've lost track of where I am in the comments. I pushed the wrong button, scroll down too far, and I've lost track of your comments. Um, I'm back now. I got back to where I need to be. Evelina says, pretty sly, aren't they? Or so they think. Steve says, every bill should stand alone. And Steve says, post-COVID America will be horrid. Five mega billionaires and one trillionaire will own everything. The rest of us will be poor. Well, it depends on what we do to take over the government, Steve. Susan Eldred says, if Obama, Clinton, Biden, et al., and corporate money supported and promoted and pushed for Medicare for all, FJG, GND, et cetera, we would have it. Sure, we would. Majority and people in this country across the political spectrum support um, Bernie's agenda. Yes, they do. Carmen says, I meant tax cuts for the rich, as you were talking about um, 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 Nancy's um, Heroes Bill Act. Oh, okay, Carmen, I get it. Sandy says, shared. And Anthony Famularo says, Steve Wolfbrandt, uh, MAGA Post. COVID America will make it uh, much worse uh, by vote blue. Uh, okay, I kind of agree, um, Anthony, that um, certainly MAGA, if MAGA controls, uh, uh, the post uh, by COVID America, it's going to make it um, far worse. But I'm not convinced that the conclusion is uh, vote blue. But I can be convinced. Depends on what the vote blues want to run on. If they want to run, okay, on Medicare for all, and they want to run on the Green New Deal. And they want to run, okay, on the elimination of student debt. They want to run on job guarantee and so on. Okay, then I'm open um, but to voting for whoever vows on a stack of Bibles that they're going to pass that. But otherwise, <clears throat> I want to find someone else who's willing to vow on a stack of Bibles that if they win, they're going to do all they can to pass it. Steve says, support um, Shahed against um, um, Nancy, donate. Absolutely. There are a number of key races. There's the Shahed versus Nancy Pelosi. we got to get Shahed in. There's the Michaela Wilkes versus Steny Hoyer. We have to get Steny Hoyer out okay, and Michaela Wilkes in. We get rid of those two. 
I don't know what's going on with Jeffries, um, Hakeem Jeffries. If we can get rid of him, uh, that would be good too. But the basic thing is we need to replace Nancy Pelosi with someone we can deal with. The one I'd really like is Jayapal. But if we can't get um, a Jayapal, and I'm assuming we can't get any of the squad, then the most acceptable person would probably be Barbara Lee. Now, Stephen Day says, Shahid, who was in San Francisco to vote out um, but Pelosi, yes, Shahid Buttar, exactly. Susan says, I don't know how these people can sleep at night. <laughs> Susan, they eat a lot of designer ice cream. Put some right to sleep. Steve said, yes. Susan said, they all need to be voted out. They do. Carmen says, Uncle Tom, but Uncle Tom was actually for the people. Well, the book, Uncle Tom, was actually for the people, but the Uncle Toms were not. Carmen says, clink, clink, cheers to the teacups. And Kay says, Obama gave an online talk to college grads on the MSM News Night, SMH. I couldn't watch it. Me neither. Me neither. Evelina, Dr. Joe, more than wish, I thought. I think. He's in time to unsuspend his campaign uh, uh, by Bernie, I mean. I don't expect him to unsuspend. Susan said we should buy Kelton's book and send it to our reps in the House and Senate. But send it along with a copy, okay, of, uh, uh, but send it along with a letter that has a link to OCF, because I don't think you're going to find OCF in Stephanie's book. You might find the Mint the Coin idea in Stephanie's book. Okay, I'm not going to say no to that, but I doubt that she's been paying attention to overt um, 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 the congressional financing. Susan Hodges says, how is FDR able to accomplish what he did? Can you imagine him trying to pass... Um, social security today well um, 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 it was a depression um, everybody was scared out of their wits he had won a huge victory in 1936 it was the biggest victory in history um, up until that time and he was very very powerful and if he wanted to pass some social welfare legislation, a social safety net, not many people outside the Republican Party were going to oppose him. And the Democrats had huge majorities in 1937, huge majorities. And Steve says Biden's been in politics for over 40 years. Now he needs task forces to figure out what to do. Well, He's been in cognitive decline. What he needs the task forces for is to put together something that might be attractive to the progressive votes that right now he's not able to get. That's what this is about. Susan, check out some of Harvey Kay's conversations on YouTube uh, news shows. Uh, he just wrote a book about all that. He's written a few books about all that. And Kay says SS expansion is needed um, badly along with Medicare for all. Yes, it is. It is needed badly, and it's part of Bernie's agenda. Steve says Biden's not Trump, senile rapist, but you got to do it anyway, TDS. And Steve says um, Joe said he needs Bernie to govern. Um, put on a dress, Bernie. Joe E. won't know. <laughs> Russ says, yes, the task forces are just another committee. Stephen Day says, yes, Lana Postcard, yes, that is a good idea about the task forces being publicized, Joe. 
And Carmen says, yeah, well, those for show task forces aren't going to work. DT will remain and the tragedy will continue. I don't think they're going to work either. But where the DT is going to remain, I think, is going to have to do with how many people remain unemployed and how many people remain in suffering and how many people die. Yeah, the certified letters Facebook group, exactly. Sandy says, yes, we need to restart the, the letters group. All we need to do is start posting there again, folks, because it's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Kay says, I'm glad you're right on that, Carmen. This live stream is being posted there. Carmen says, masks capture COVID uh, droplets. Yes, they do on the outside. Kay says, the bars in Ohio were packed today with no spacing and no masks either. Well, 14 days from now, 14 days from now, more cases, more cases 14 days from now. People wear masks in case they sneeze or cough. Carmen says, they sure aren't wearing them at the recently opened bars. Tragic. The one I saw in Columbus, too. A so-called blue spot in Ohio. Must be in the Columbus suburbs. They're not blue. Catherine Tokarska says, surgeons wear masks performing surgeries. Somehow they manage to complete their complicated tasks without passing out from lack of oxygen. Yes, they do. Personally, when I go out and I have my mask on, it's fine. I can breathe. Uh, what's a little annoying is when I'm indoors okay, and not uh, out of doors, I wear glasses. If I happen to be wearing glasses at that point, my glasses have a tendency to fog up. But I can just take them off for a second and they unfog and put them back on. I'm not in a situation when I'm outside. I'm not in a situation where I have to wear my glasses constantly. Steve says, won't be blue for long if blue means low COVID area. <laughs> Russ says, thank, sounds good on the memes, thank you. L. Stephen Day says, Stephanie Kelton's deficit myth book is out. Steve, I ha I've had it on order for over a year. I haven't received any notification that it's out yet. I was under the impression that it wasn't going to be out until June the 9th. They've been taking orders for it for over a year, <laughs> as I say. I have the Kindle version ordered. Carmen says, and they do surgeries for hours upon hours. Yeah. And I think there are many of the doctors who wear glasses, too, aren't there? Somehow the glasses don't fog up, so they must have figured out how to do that. Lana says, what I'd like to do is get all of Congress, both sides, in a room, bound and gag, and force them to learn and agree that MNT is how it works. Yes, and not let them out of the room. Not let them out of the room until they pass a test about how MNT works. Quarantine them there. Okay, says Cleveland and Columbus areas used to both be blue spots here, but not so much uh, these days. Well, Cleveland is still very blue, isn't it? Okay, says they're both hot spots for the virus, too. Steve says only N95 or better will protect the mask wearer. That's right, but uh, this is about uh uh, all people being okay, in masks, and then there is some degree of uh, the protection from those who are wearing masks, even if they're not the N95 type. Even when this has a fantasy of mine, too, even in my simple language and grasp of it. Carmen says, I'd like to use the clockwork orange method so they realize how many. I read that before. Steve Day says OCF is needed. Carmen Nunez says, oops. Daniel says no mandatory vaccine. Carmen says they will if they're forced to see it. 
Evelina says, not really austerity, it's good management. That's what they say. It's terrible management. Okay, it's managing, uh, uh, okay, um, it's managing according to the debt to GDP ratio, okay, and according to the size of the debt. That's terrible management. It has nothing to do with solvency. Okay, says, I really doubt that Carmen or rich people don't care how many of them kill off or make miserable, Carmen says. Carmen says, oh, that's why Nancy has that red fox in the hen house hair, rotten skank. Oops. Evelina says, in Mexico's case, just means good management, not really austerity. Uh, well, I guess we just have to see what AMLO is doing. I'm not aware of how much he's doing. How's the social safety net doing, okay, in Mexico, Evelina? Has he cut any of that? Carmen says, because they don't see it, if they see it, they have no choice to care. The human psyche works like that. All of them aren't psychopaths. It's true, all of them aren't psychopaths. But it's out of sight, you know, it's out of mind. I mean, you open up, uh, you know, your refrigerator, and you live uh, right on San Francisco Bay, and you live in a neighborhood that's absolutely filthy wealthy, and you're traveling around first class, okay, and in limousines, and you never see the people. And so, um, over a period of years, uh, you just become a sociopath. That's it. Okay, says, I've been following the movement for a People's Party. Yeah, I think People's Party is making progress. Steve Wolfman says, good. Evelina says, uh, me too, but not much on Green New Deal. Uh, the People's Party is for the Green New Deal. Uh, they published, okay, an agenda last year, and it was heavy with Green New Deal then, heavy with Green New Deal. I don't think they've changed their mind on that. And Steve Day says, say OCF first and explain with MMT when asked. No, just explain, okay, what OCF is. You don't have to bring in the MMT until you're talking about um, inflation. Okay, folks, it's 1114. I'm going to have to leave some of your comments uh, unanswered, okay, I'm afraid. I hate to do that, but uh, we've been on your comments now for, uh, for nearly an hour, and it's wonderful. I like them, but I've been on for two hours and 15 minutes, and I'm getting real tired. So... Yeah, Jamal. Yeah, Jamal's shows are excellent. Uh, he and I entirely agree about the message that was sent to the Democrats by Nancy Pelosi. What to the progressives, okay, by Nancy Pelosi. I guess we're just not that much into you. Anyway, Barney is whispering to me good night, so I'm going to whisper to you good night. And there's a lot of discussion on Michael Brooks and Anna Kasparian and all the other indie progressive outlets. That's good. I watch them too. And how Harvey K was talking. It's all very interesting, folks. I'm glad you made all these comments, even though I cannot really read them. Uh, someone tells me Cleveland is not very blue these days. What the hell has happened to Cleveland? And to say goodbye, I'm gonna I'm gonna show my ticker once again. Yeah, Bonnie's laughing about the ticker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Good night. Good night. I'm ending.
parting is such sweet sorrow. 